Max, your source for Warhammer Underworlds in under 30 minutes per game at tournament speed. I am your host, <laughs> Phil. With me, as always, my co-host, Davey. How are you doing, Davey? Doing pretty well. Uh, yeah. Really got that uh, convention fever, the, the Grand Clash fever, I should say. It's yeah. been fun to be uh, prepping for something again. Yeah, it's 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 coming up quick. Um, and joining us to talk through our tournament preparations and what you could probably be doing to help prepare for any tournaments you're going to be going to is Jimmy Molini. Um, obviously, you've been seen around the community plenty of times, played in plenty of tournaments, um, has a breadth of experience in this game. So wanted to get his opinions. Jimmy, how you doing? Hey, guys. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, I, I'm doing well. I'm super pumped. We got six weeks to Acon, uh, AdeptCon, for those folks who aren't familiar. Um, it's a, one of the largest uh, tabletop gaming tournaments, conventions, what have you, in the United States. Uh, when is It starts on the, what, the 25th of March, something like that? Uh, yeah, 24th, 25th in there. 24th, or like that, so. Yeah, I think the tournament's on the 24th for yeah. Underworlds. So yeah, we are going to be talking today about, uh, you know, what what our preparation steps look like as you're heading towards a major tournament and uh, sort of how you can tweak and prepare and get ready to go. Um, yeah, Phil and I have been to the one Adepticon Grand Clash in 2019. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Feels like I a did a. Ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did the the team event. Uh, I guess I technically the first year of uh, the very first year that they did anything at Wapaka, they called it a Grand Clash, but it wouldn't be recognizable as such. Now, Jimmy, you've done how many? Do you, do you know offhand how many you've, you've attended? Yeah, I, um, my first event was Gen Con in 2019 then after that i went to nova in the same year and then the following year in january before um covid 19 kind of took over the world i went the what now to the (laughs) (laughs) it's a bad word it's a bad word i know i know earmuffs for anyone um but uh i went to warhammer world for one of their grand clashes in the uk which was a a lot of fun yeah i remember talking to you in the run-up to that a little bit i think we yeah, we ex- did some practice together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, we got excited about a, a weird list that maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah. story, story of my life. But yeah. yes, uh, but you, if I remember right, it was uh, Gen Con 2019. You won that, correct, with Reavers? Uh, correct. All right, mm. so we got some expertise. Yeah, yeah for my own heart, went in with Reavers. <laughs> yeah, no, don't talk me up too much, especially <laughs> especially in the lead up to an event after I haven't been to one in a while. I'm I'm just a I'm just a broken man with a new two year old right now. <laughs> that's all, that's all I am. I haven't played much in a while. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what pandemic will do is a new two year old, right? Like mm-hmm. last time I did anything, I didn't have a child. Now I've got a two year old. Yeah, like, crazy. <laughs> All right. Well, before we jump into our main topic, talking more about uh, those prep ideas, um, we got our standards. We got community shout outs. We got what the heck's going on with you. We'll start with some quick community shout outs. Uh, so personally, I just been catching up on some reading, um, seeing what people have been posting to blogs. And I saw most recently posted uh, Flavius is posting a series now on objective placement post Herodeep. Um, first article is sort of just a primer. It's not specifically talking any of the strategies of where to place your tokens, but, uh, it should be a pretty fun article. I always think that those, uh, objective placement articles are interesting. It's sort of that the next level kind of stuff to be thinking about, um, beyond just your warband. Um, and, uh, a little while back now, but, um, and also did a, uh, post far soul raid uh, review up sort of update, um, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, Jimmy, you got any community shout outs you'd like to let people know about? Yeah. Um, you know, in the <clears throat> lead up to in-person events, I know they've had one or two at, uh, Warhammer world in the UK and Nottingham. And, you know, now in the lead up to Adepticon, you know, exciting to get everyone back together. But I, I feel, I would feel remiss not giving a shout out to the, 
vassal discord group and especially Shuby, which has really kind of helped keep the community alive in the last geez like two years now so um, yeah. that's been certainly a great resource for anyone who wants to stay active in the game as many of us uh, have been and uh, it just takes a lot of work to keep that going so um just shout out to Shuby and everyone else has been a part of that it's um certainly been a lot of fun playing with you guys and um certainly hope the also the community keeps going uh, as live events return because it's a it's a, honestly a great way to play with people all over the world without sure. leaving your you know pc room so it's uh, pretty cool <laughs> yeah yeah definitely a good way even just to talk about it i know phil you uh posted the deck you've been working with and got some pretty immediate feedback that was kind of a cool yeah i mean you got when you've got people in just about every time zone you can kind of <laughs> there's post. always somebody gonna talk to you yeah <laughs> you can post stuff whenever you're thinking about it and you'll probably get some kind of response um so yeah i mean it's it's really great uh and i i definitely take advantage of it um it's a good community you might you might need to turn off some of your notifications for those discords so you, <laughs> might, you might get a, quite a few that is um, true <laughs> All right. And then, uh, Davey, what, what the heck is going on with you? Uh, I've been doing a lot of purifying, actually. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll talk a little more about how I kind of landed on them to be messing around with. But, uh, uh, you know, as we'll talk about in this episode, trying to figure out what we're going to bring to this grand clash. And uh, that's one of the one of the candidates. Uh, and so messing around with them uh, has been interesting. I'd never... I don't think I'd ever played them before and I actually hadn't played against them all that often some, but, but not much. So, um, that in and of itself is always fun is to kind of explore a, a corner of the game that you haven't shed a lot of light on just on your own. So, um, that's yeah. what I'm up to. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy, how about you? Yeah, I've, um, I've, I took a little bit of a break in the last couple of months, but now I've kind of been getting back into the game and, uh, obviously need to do certainly more prep ahead of Adepticon, but I think I'm, I think I'm getting into swing of things. I think I'm just getting into, um, into the current meta, seeing what's out there. Uh, a lot of war bands that uh, I played against a lot in the end of the last season are still good. And there's some new additions, which are cool. So yes, yeah, so identifying, you know, which of the new cards are best. And I, I, I think I've decided what war band I'm going to take. I'm not really sure yet. I'm going to go in between, <laughs> you know, like three or four different options. And it's like one of those things where I, uh, like many of us, right, don't have a, the time to play games daily. So let's say I get a game in once a week, I'll play a game and someone will just stop me. And I'm like, well, I can't play that war band. Let's <laughs> yeah. do something else. And then just <laughs> keep cycling through it. But uh, yeah, we're, I'm getting, getting closer. So it's, uh, it's been fun. I know the feeling. Um, <laughs> I mean, what the heck is going on with you, Phil? Yeah, yeah. well, uh, so, so started... So last time we were talking uh, that I was going to try out the Black Powders Buccaneers and uh, just played two games with them and realized that that was definitely not going to be an option for Adepticon. Um, I mean, they seem okay for Rivals, but like, man, it was rough even in Rivals. So uh, switching gears, I now have like three or four Warbands I'm trying to work my way through, trying Crushes at the moment, which I've pretty much never played them before and uh yeah talking about getting stomped um had a game against my old co-host buddy here gave me a big old zero for a glory score against the purifying <laughs> <laughs> so feeling a little rough there but it's been fun they're they're a totally different experience very different as long experience. as you always re-roll those defensive aether quartz into uh crits yeah easy mode so. surprisingly hard to <laughs> win a, an aggro mat game when you can't stop someone from rolling crits on those re-rolls well phil phil don't feel too bad uh davies an excellent player as you know well so, i no. i do know this but it was it was probably one of the worst beatdowns i've gotten in a while so it was good though it was fun uh and always always fun playing with our local group and i think we've got what like five people from our local group who are going to be going down to adepticon so yeah yeah and that's fun. kind of what got us a little bit of excited about this uh, uh about this topic is that we've been we've been wanting to kind of you know approach it almost from a team perspective of you know like uh i i'd love to go and, and do well but man i'd be super excited if uh, anyone from our group went and and uh you yeah. know 
performed. I just, you know, want people are setting their different, um, kind of their different goals and that sort of thing. And I just want to people see, see people meet and exceed that. And, um, I'd be, man, I'd be stoked to be watching some of our guys make it to the top tables and all that stuff. So that'd be, that'd be pretty awesome. Definitely. Well, let's get into our main topic to see how we could help our friends and some of the good listeners there, how they could maybe try and get to the top tables. Obviously no promises here, but, <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, guaranteed or your money back, yeah. whatever, you paid. <laughs> whatever you paid us, you'll get it right back. Um, yeah. So prepping for a grand clash. Um, so the basic, basic sort of outline we we've got an idea, Jimmy, you've kind of got an outline that you are working through here as well. Um, but so, so you're sort of picking your war bands, choosing how to prepare for your, what opponents there will be, what you think they will be. And then some like, uh, sort of figuring out like, what are your, what are your sort of outliers, significant cards in the meta that you need to figure out. So, um, yeah. Do you, uh, do you want to run down your, you have kind of like a five point plan. Well, that'll almost be in parallel. There's a lot of overlap. Do you want to? Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, in kind of, taking it, you know, uh, back to kind of where I think all of us kind of start, right? The order of operations of like what you think about ahead of a big event. Um, yeah, there are probably five things that I think about before I kind of pick and choose my warband and start deciding, okay, yeah, I'm taking this and let's just get better at this, right? So first, and, you know, obviously it's self-explanatory. I'm not some kind of, you know, genius or savant for thinking this, but uh, it's important to learn the new cards and warbands, right? That's mm-hmm. the first thing you should do, um, particularly before making any of the decisions, because every new release, what that's one of the fun things about Underworlds. There are lots of new cards that come out. There are new warbands that are released. It keeps the game fresh. And the meta can really change with the insertion of even just a handful of cards, right? I think um, we all, from playing the game over time, understand that um, you know, one or two cards could really make certain decks possible or 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 certain play styles not possible right so i think it's uh at least from a standpoint of winning an event right obviously you can do anything you'd like but from a standpoint of winning an event their you know individual card to warbands can be pretty important so learning new cards and warbands then once you do that it should help you diagnose the meta right so what is the current meta uh certainly playing in your local meta is helpful for that uh playing online has been helpful for me you can see what people have come up with across the world reading up on some from some of the content creators or you know listening to um humble podcasts like this one or others that's just a good way to get a feel for what the meta is then three once you understand the meta choose your play style and in broad strokes you can probably try to do one of three things right either be the best at the current meta two you can counter the meta or three you can build you know some type of all comers or well-rounded build so it's kind of up to your preference what you do there then Four, choose the war band that either best fits that play style or one that you just want to play that is, is the closest approximation to the best in your mind. And five, then choose the deck, which best fits your chosen play style and war band. So I think if um, just thinking about those things in order, I think will just give you the order of operations to make the best decisions throughout that chain. And um, if your goal is to play competitively and try to win events, that's just... Um, I think is probably a healthy way to go through it just to make sure you don't skip any steps and don't end up, you know, in a situation where it's like two weeks for the event and you're like, wow, this deck or warband is really not working. <laughs> so mm, yeah, uh, I think that's something we all probably want to avoid. We want to feel comfortable going into an event that we have something that's going to give us the best chance to do well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think to, to sort of start here, I mean, I don't know that we necessarily need to talk people through like what are all the new cards and war bands, but uh, definitely, you know, go read up. Uh, but but in terms of diagnosing the meta, um, you know, where where are we all seeing this? Uh, I think I think we probably all have a, an idea. So I'm curious what what you two are thinking, uh, Jimmy. Where do you where do you see the meta sitting at the moment? Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? Um, for me. I think one of the biggest drivers for any meta is what the best surges are, yep. right? Mm, definitely. Um, and then you, you combine that with all, also surges that are reliable, 
Um, because that's, that's another thing. I mean, there are plenty of surges out there. Hey, kill X model, roll, you know, these type of dice in this format and, yeah. uh, score your glory. But, um, having, having surges that are reliable is pretty important in a competitive event because, you know, if you're, if you're lucky, things can go well. And, and some of those, uh, some of those surges that rely a little more on variance and, randomness can benefit you and then we've all been bitten before by bad <laughs> dice or bad draws and it just you know it can become problematic so it can consistency is probably what you're looking for if you want to be competitive players so yeah just what are the best surges and what are the most um reliable surges and uh it's interesting for this meta with we're still kind of in that zone of primacy being important most of the surges involve killing other models you have lots of good um, end phase, which assists aggro. So I think the meta is a little more aggressive than maybe past metas, such as the one during Beast Grave, where it's all about, you know, temporary victory and hidden purpose. But um, at the same time, I do think there are some nice cards that revolve around sitting on tokens and feature tokens. So um, uh, someone, I think it was, um, I think it was Compaq had a nice article a, a few weeks back about the current Harrow Deep meta and then talked a little about it. And I agree with his assertion, which is, I think the current meta is aggressive, but because of placement of objectives and not having placement on egg checks we're kind of forced to be in the middle now. Mm. Um, yeah. So it's kind of a bit of an aggro um, mess in the middle. And then lastly, I think you also try to sit on tokens while you do that. So um, that's kind of what I've seen and uh, how I've, seen good warbands played recently and there are certain warbands that do that very well um and certain warbands that don't do it quite as well so it's it's interesting i think it's a lot of fun it's predicated on a lot of engagement which is always fun for playing games so um yeah it's kind of where where i think it's sitting right now yeah uh davy you have any other thoughts i mean i think jimmy hit it big time by by saying surge is kind of available surges kind of dictate a lot. Um, and I think one of the other aspects that we, we see is that there's some reliable dice free kind of surges that, uh, involve, uh, supported attacks or surrounding, um, people. So, uh, yeah. War bands that can do that sort of thing without sacrificing too much of their tempo or game plan, um, have, have a little bit of a step up, I think in this, cause they can, they can count on some of those. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. And I, and I think we're sort of seeing, there's there's a handful that I don't think anyone would disagree are like becoming fairly ubiquitous. I think contest was of equals. I mean, even restricted, it's kind of showing up in a lot of places because it's pretty easy to score. Reckless swing. Um, oh, and I guess for folks who don't know, contest of equals is a surge where if an attack after an attack action that's failed, if the attack roll and defense rolls are having the same number of successes, you score one glory. Reckless swing, you make an attack against a fighter uh, with more supporting fighters. It is range one, though. More supporting fighters than the attacker. Um, I mean, like, both of those, if you're playing even just a little aggressively, you can probably score those pretty easily. I think silver lining is still showing up in a lot of places, um, especially if you have access to card draw. So that's just have four or more upgrades in your hand after an activation. Uh, upgrades are not always something you want a full hand of, but if you are going to get one anyway, <laughs> might as well score some glory off of it. So like you have all these passive surges, but they don't all, they're not passive, like the old hold objective surges. So I, I definitely agree. I'm also seeing the meta sort of in this mid range flexi kind of place skewing probably more towards aggro. Um, although I, was just tinkering with uh, some stalkers decks this morning, and I, it's Look, like they pull them back in completely <laughs> passive hold <laughs> objectives, and it kind of feels like it could work. So, um, who knows? But I would definitely say right now it feels like people because of this card pool, um, and I think generally folks will agree that this card pool is fairly limited right now um, in what you kind of see as being viable. So there, there is a lot of sort of this get in the middle and punch them up. Yeah. It's interesting that you, you brought up a couple that uh, do have some random aspects to them. So 
uh, and we can a little bit. You know, yeah, the the mulligan can help control some of the silver lining thing, but uh, contest of equals, I think you see that specifically because there there's some war bands who really have a hard time finding. You know, obviously it's good, it's restricted, but uh, I that I end up including in decks where I just can't find enough. If if I'm going to be fighting and I just can't find enough. Uh, uh, surges that I think are scorable. That's how it ends up. It ends up. It, it's almost always for me like a, a fifth or a sixth edition rather than a, a first or a second. Um, Definitely would agree. Um, it's kind of like a branching fate too, where you're like, well, I'm probably going to be rolling dice, so I'll yeah. edge my bets, kind of thing. You're not necessarily expecting it to always happen, but eventually, if you roll enough dice, it should happen. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I view a silver lining. It's almost like a bit of a hedge. Right, yep, because yep. if you if you draw a gambit, a set of you know power cards, and it's really heavy with gambits, then you're probably really set up for the first first round of a game, um, because those are more impactful early on. Mm-hmm. And if you happen to draw a bunch of upgrades, well, it's kind of a hedge. Well, okay, we don't have the gambits you want, but you make it a a, a glory right off the bat just by because of the hand you drew. So um, that's kind of how I view that. Up. If that said, if you um, I think if you really want to have silver lining, the best way to do it is to also have some type of card draw yep. yeah. in your deck. I agree. So, um, I agree. yeah, but it, otherwise it just, it gets a little bit too random, but if you have some card draw, I think it's, or, or you by design, um, take activations in your play style to draw cards. I think it's a little more reasonable. Yeah. Agreed. So, so that's a, without getting too deep in the weeds of like what cards make the meta (laughs) i think that gives an idea of where we see the meta at um you know your mileage may vary but i i think most people would agree and i think most people are playing in and around that play style so knowing that uh we're now on to the fun part of what warband do you then pick (laughs) to uh navigate this meta um, we already mentioned some of the war bands we're all looking at, but uh, maybe let's get some reasoning for that, those picks. So, Jimmy, why why are you looking at what you're looking at? Yeah, you know, I guess what I'll, what I'll speak to, um, that may be, it's relevant for me, and I think relevant for most of the listeners, kind of what, what I'm seeing a lot out there when I'm playing games. I think, um, I think Dreppers are still really good. Uh, I yep. think it's it's a war band that has certainly been hit and nerfed recently, rightfully so, because I think last year uh, they were just really absurd, <laughs> uh, <laughs> frankly. Um, but I think having range two, um, having a lot of great in faction cards, having a push that can move you around in on your own board uh, for free is really nice. And then their inspired condition is really nice, especially in a environment where you're often engaging with the opponent so they're going to be within two of people a lot so they're going to inspire quickly uh, i know the mechanic has changed a little bit worse but it's still it's still pretty effective even um even though sure. they inspire after their activation now but uh yeah um yeah and i guess with with the range two i think it allows them to be offensive while also sitting on tokens and like i said i think the a lot of the really good surges and end phase do involve sitting on feature tokens. And if you're range two, it's a lot easier to get to where you need to be and sit on the tokens, score what you need to score, and also attack the opponent. Yeah. So um, having four or three fighters with the range two is is really nice for that. So I think Dreppers are really good. Uh, I still think Hroth is, is pretty good. Um, he's just... Uh, He's he's really good at aggro, and he also has some really nice passive surges. Yeah. So, um, if um, in a meta where you're going to be aggressive, uh, he he hits the hardest, in my opinion, and also the most effectively, even with some recent restrictions. And we also do have a lot of healing cards still in the game. So, um, and cards like punching up are restricted. So the horde war bands are maybe a little bit less effective mm. versus him. So. Um, I think, uh, uh, I think Roth is still really good. And, um, yeah, I think they're, I think what you've seen from the UK, uh, I know they, these were, I think one of them was a rivals event. The other one was rivals plus, but, um, I think Rippus did very well. And then in yeah. an environment where, um, an environment where there aren't that many cards in the universal pool, the war men that are typically best are the ones with 
the greatest number of good faction cards, right? And Ripus has always had excellent faction cards. And yeah. so if you're in a meta where you are going to be, you know, aggressive, um, I think elite war bands do, do a good job now. Um, I think Ripas are certainly an elite war band that can be aggressive and also has a ton of great faction cards. So no surprise they did well in that, in that format, different from championship format, of course, but, uh, um, I, you know, wouldn't count them out at all. Right. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the, the universal pool being small and I, I think we've mentioned this before. I think part of what makes it feel even smaller than it, you know, technically is, is that no small portion of the dire chasm cards are <laughs> hunger related or yeah. hunter quarry related, Great which kind of cordons them off from, from being useful to quite a few war bands or requires so much more investment. And so once you, once you remove those yeah. from the mix, you are really left looking at a much smaller handful of cards. And so, um, war bands that have a leg up in that, uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons froth has some some extra mileage is that he brings his hunter quarry mechanic. He makes sure it's in play. Uh, and then of course, vampires, right? Like yeah. their, yep. their universal Agreed. pool is, I don't know, 25% bigger than anybody else's maybe more because <laughs> they, they actually are looking at all those hunger cards. So, yeah. yeah. Great point. And they're hunters. So I mean, even better. <laughs> doesn't, so, doesn't hurt. Yeah. Um, and, and primacy cards. I mean, a lot of the stuff that relies on primacy, you're not guaranteed to be able to pick up in just any warband. Um, so, I don't know. Like that, that there was a lot of stuff in Dire Chasm that was very like cordoned off to very specific warbands. It felt like, and I think you're right. There is now this whole subsection of the card pool where you just sort of are like, and I'm just going to scroll right past this because I'm not looking at any of these. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing I'll add too, and um, I think is very true given the most recent FAR, because um, we've been waiting for a FAR for a long time. But in looking at where we're at now, um, I think one of the cool things is that there, while we're talking about certain warbands being stronger than others, I think the meta is about as flat as it's been in a long time. I think a lot of sure. warbands are pretty good. Sure. So we're too. seeing, yeah, we're seeing that kind of really with the exception of Drepper last season or the, you know, the, the dire chasm war bands are very well balanced. Um, the older war bands, a lot of them could still compete. So I think there, there are a lot of good options right now. And mm. I think um, certainly we're talking about some that may be in certain situations better than others, but um, I, I just want to also say, I think there are a lot of war bands that can be good right now. And, and I'm very interested to see kind of what the war band spread is uh, at, at Adepticon, because totally. I know in the last uh, several Vassal clashes, I think in the top eight, there were eight unique warbands each time in the last like two or three events. So um, yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, I think you think about a lot of other warbands that are just very solid, like Seraphon, uh, Crushes, um, Dread Pageant. You know, I think they're just, there are a lot of good warbands right now. And I'm just, yeah. uh, it'll be a lot of fun to see what we see at Adepticon. I'd put Cun and Crew in there. They've got a lot of great uh, infaction cards. Um, great point. Know, yeah. So. I mean, really take advantage of those support cards. Yeah. Um, in ways other people just can't do, <laughs> which is fun. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, so that's a lot of good met, like on meta picks. Uh, but Davey, you've been practicing something that's a little off meta. Uh, yeah. Why? What, did, what, well, what drew you to them? <laughs> actually, part of this came from uh, tip of the head to Aman because uh, he mentioned in passing talking about uh, hating to play against purifiers because it always feels so hard. Uh, hmm. and I was like, you know what? I totally feel the same way. Like every time I line up against them, I'm like, ah, what am I supposed to do? Um, and some of it's because I just don't play very often. I'm like, well, what if I did that to other people? <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, I wanted to take a look. You know, is there we talked about the the uh this predilection for if you're a warband that wants to kind of advance and brawl there's a lot of options out there for you and like what what if there's a warband there that is okay with not advancing uh and making you come to them and, and fight on maybe uh suboptimal terms and so playing around i mean that that's basically every time i mostly because of Bahnar. Like I, I'm like, oh, can I run past them? I always range too gross. And then and it just starts <laughs> smashing away at you. Um, yeah. But, uh, but there's a lot of range in that war band. You know, there's, there's uh, two other range three fighters. And um, anyway, so I, I think uh, 
I think that was kind of uh, the reason I explored that a little bit. Uh, I've got some other candidates too, but um, the idea of, uh, you know, a, a war room, but like Jimmy said, you know, with a, a fairly flat, uh, I don't know, flat distribution of, of power levels, it's, it's kind of, it feels like a lot of things are, are wide open, but um, I think uh, this is something Jimmy and I had talked about. Uh, I think when you were headed to the UK, it was like, hey, yeah, like you play something that isn't being played all over the place and you, you've got more reps with it than anybody else. Then, you know, maybe you catch some people by surprise uh, versus I'm going to play, you know, hypothetically people have played against a lot of Crosscorn at this point and um, that doesn't make him not powerful. He's incredibly powerful, but they they are more likely to have a, a game plan. Okay, if I see Rothborn, I need to do this. Uh, yeah. And if you can bring something that they're not practiced against, then maybe you... But uh, on further reflection, I think we might have decided that, like, well, maybe that, that helps you get through, you know, early rounds, but maybe not the later rounds where uh, people are a little better. Yeah, prepared. well, that's something that uh, um, I learned when I was over at, at the UK, and, you know, I joked with Davey about this after the event, but, um, you know, it's interesting at, um, at Warhammer world, I think when I was there, there were like 146 different players. Right. (laughs) So, which which was, which was awesome. And one of the, um, best parts for me to see is that, I mean, everyone I played was good. I mean, there, there were no (laughs) guineas that in in that entire room, everyone came prepared. They came with good war bands and, um, and that was a meta that I think was pretty clearly defined by, you know, temporary victory, you know, mm-hmm. Grimwatch and their surges, thorns. So it was really a really specific play style that that did really well. And we were in a stage of the game where even aggressive warbands like Ripas and others that did well into those warbands just couldn't really couldn't hold a candle to them. So I think in that top sixteen, I think it, I mean, I don't know, what was it? There were like six or seven uh, thorn players or something like that, if I remember correctly. So it was just, um, um, yeah. So it's one of those things where I looked back on it and if my goal was, I took Magors um, for anyone didn't know, but uh, I did, I had kind of like a hold two objective play style with them. So I could, I could be aggressive, but I could also sit back against a more aggressive war band. And it, it was fun. And I had, a, I had a great time. I went um, three and one. I think I finished like, you know, like 30, 34th out of like 146, but, but you know, traveling across the pond to go to an event like that, I look back and I'm like, I probably should have played something that was like empirically better. <laughs> just because <laughs> It's a little bit arrogant to think that I could just take something off meta and, uh, and not as good and do well in a room that was that good, that it were a lot of, there are a lot of top players there. Um, they can mo- you know, Tommy combo is there. Mm. Um, Michael Carlin was there. Um, Tom Bond was there all, you know, John Reese, all those people were there and it was, uh, it was fun meeting all those folks, but, um, yeah, I probably should have just taken something a little bit more empirically good as opposed <laughs> to trying to be cute. Uh, <laughs> if, if my goal was to like, to, to, you know, get close to winning the event. So there, there's that, I mean, in smaller events, maybe you can be a little more creative if uh, you want to be creative and also win. And I, I also want to, you know, throw a shout out there to folks that, Maybe their goal isn't isn't really just say, "Hey, I want to win this event." Maybe it's just to go in there and have fun. In that case, pick whatever you want, like that, you know, and have yeah. pick whatever you want to have the best time and and that you'll enjoy the most. But um, yeah, in, yeah. in that situation, my goal was to at least get to the top sixteen because I traveled, you know, across the ocean <laughs> to get there. And uh, yeah. I, I was looking back on it, I was like, I probably should have shouldn't have been, uh, you know, so cute with that choice. But yeah, anyways. I mean, if you if your goal is to if you want to be, you know, the, I want to be the top finishing, whatever player, that's another thing you can go for. And sure. if you pick something like Godsworn in 2019, you can do it just by entering. So yeah, be the only one, be everyone's hero forever <laughs> and lose your first game and tie your second. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, I mean, so it's sort of, I mean, all of this is talking through these counter meta picks and some of the foibles that you can run into by doing that but i i think going along with this flatter competitive field i think you as we've mentioned we do have you know a number of options that could potentially get you there um that are maybe not the things people are thinking about um so i think davy you mentioned cunning crew Mm. i think soul raid are actually still pretty well positioned if they are played by someone who knows them really well yeah and then hunger vamps i think i mean it's like those are all 
not necessarily the things you're expecting. Um, they're not the most popular, but I think that the, you got to keep them in mind because they're probably still lurking there in small numbers and they could ruin your day. Uh, sure. Yeah, I think uh, of those uh, hunger vamps is is one I uh, I think I termed it a problematic outlier where you're like not really doing the same thing as a lot of other people. And if you've never practiced against it, you you if you don't have a plan for it, you're going to it's going to be a real uphill battle. So, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, whatever, whatever plan you make for that can also apply to other decks that decide they're going to um, try to score a lot of passive glory like they, they might. So, yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, so I, like I said, I've been practicing crushes and I've kind of found through a couple of practice games that you, think actually need to lean more aggro than flex with them but um i think i think on the the far ends like pure aggro and the hold objective side of the game we're not seeing as much of it right now and you probably need to have some sort of a game plan for that as well uh because if your opponent doesn't care about fighting in the middle (laughs) make sure you've got a way to get to them Um, yeah always hard Yeah. yeah yeah like you're saying so yeah, that's that's a good point. That's something that I've noticed in my games that the fact that we don't have cards like Distraction, Mischievous Spirits, Restless Prize in the game anymore, uh, you know, sitting on objectives in your territory to score, you know, things like Supremacy. I mean, it may, it's it seems more viable now. And then you add on other cards like you know, Claim the City and Infestation for Gits and Sepulchral Guard. I mean, um, the, with Gloom Tokens and how. The wording of those cards has completely changed the meaning of how, how it is to score <laughs> yeah, that card. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think there's, yeah, that's to, to I think both your points, my dark horse would be kind of those hold three objective war bands, because while I do feel that they have a lot of trouble versus a, a war band like Hrothgorn, uh, I think it's, I think he just will lay into them and score way too much glory. Um, by just killing a ton of models, I think against other war bands and builds, it can do very well. So if you get a little bit lucky and don't face Hrothkorn, yeah, you know, I think Seraphon's in there too. I think uh, if they have more of like a hold three type build, so um, yeah, I'm, I'd be curious to see how many of those war bands are there because it is a little bit different uh, to both your points. I think everyone or a lot of people are playing kind of somewhere in the middle and a bit of a mosh pit. Uh, but if you're sitting back doing hold three, um, yeah, it could be a bit of a curveball for some folks. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, that's a pretty good discussion of meta picks, counter meta picks. We've talked through what sort of we're looking at right now. I will say I'm I'm also looking at Hrothgorn and Stalkers. Um, so I kind of have a gamut right now of sort of the full aggro, middle aggro, and then completely hold objectives. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, this should completely be... Completely hold objectives is... Yeah. is uh... Croc Gar, what's his name? Croc, Croc. Well, uh, <laughs> Clack Croc. Croc. Clack Croc. Is he I mean, is he a joke to you? What's going on here? <laughs> he, he is there to intimidate the opponent, <laughs> and he is successful. Yeah. Uh, we don't really care about what he does, except for standing in the way, guarding the. We don't skates. talk about Clack Croc. Don't talk about right. Clack Croc. He's, he's like Debo, right? He's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's walks in and takes your bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, any other, uh, any other like real dark horse candidates that you want to call out, you know, call your shot now as a surprise dark, dark horse war band that people could be looking at. Uh, I, I think my, my dark horse might be a uh, sepulchral guard. I, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, Jimmy's already kind of called it a little bit with the whole three, but they have this weird, like they, they can boost up the harvester they can boost up the champion and uh, i think they're rare enough that it kind of combines a couple of those things a style of play and then a specific war band that people won't have played all that much against and i think they're actually pretty well positioned with some of the upgrades especially from arena mortis 2 um and then always for whatever reason the the death um the death faction cards uh seem to be real good so they got that boost but um i wouldn't be surprised to well maybe i i would uh that would be my tip of the hat for somebody to make a surprising run there, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, no, I um, so it's interesting. How many people, I guess, are signed up for Depthcon now? Is it, are we get are we over forty? Yeah, forty point? forty-one is right before we okay, started cool. recording. Is what I checked. <clears throat> oh, cool. So that's good, and you know, hopefully, yeah, I guess with a month to go or a month and a half, we may get to fifty, which which would be great for for a U.S. event. And um, yeah, I think there are so many war bands that are that are solid. I think really most of the season four, season three war bands are are all pretty good. Um, to Davey's point, it's just because I think both of you guys know I have a soft spot for season one. You know, one <laughs> war band I was considering playing. So I think this, I think just with the way the gloom tokens work and objective is it just be, would be very interesting. Uh, Steel Hearts Champions have a card yeah. called Cleanse. Yeah. Where if you, <laughs> yeah. if you just happen to walk across and sit on an objective and no one else is in that side, you score three glory. And there's also another card called Making a Statement that is, that's the same thing. The, so the double making a statement bill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um I mean, you know, they have all their traditional limitations, but being a season one warband and three fighter warband and all that stuff and their inspired mechanic sucks, but uh um <laughs> three that, that, fighter that'll, three range one. Yeah, all yeah. that stuff. But um they got some nice faction cards, again, faction distraction, uh some decent surges and um yeah, I just I, I was um I was tinkering with that a little bit. And I was like, this is, this is not bad. This, 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 this could work in certain situations. So we'll see. Yeah, all right. Don't, don't talk to me too much about that. Cause I'll just egg you on. So <laughs> no, I'm, and, I'm, uh, I'm definitely susceptible to that. So. You could, you could get Davey to play a dark horse match again. I think if you do that too. So. <laughs> all right, Davey, you're playing, Guard and I'm playing steel hearts. That's the way it is. It's been determined. Uh, only option. Yeah. And I guess since you mentioned them, um, I mean, we we have these hold all cards. Uh, I think we've pretty much mentioned all of them at this point. But like, so making a statement is the universal one that I think you kind of have to watch out for. And and there's other infection versions of this too. But it says, you know, if you're holding all the objectives. But since we flip stuff right now, that may mean just hold one. Um, yep. So if somebody just like does a weird like walk across your field and last activation delves an objective and you have some way to flip something you probably should because you <laughs> might you might just be coming up against a you know three or you know if it's Fulco guard with claim the city five glory swing all of a sudden yeah um so i think there's there's a number of those you got to watch out for so just keep an eye on those weird sort of why are you flipping that now kind of moves yeah no 100 percent agree i think yeah that's why i think uh um for for most of the decks that are in the meta i guess and i think the stuff you're talking about is definitely within the meta um i don't think pure aggro is is the most viable way to go. I think someone's got to be sitting on an objective, someone in your war band most of the time. Yeah. So I think just to either deny some of those cards to um, maybe score some of your own glory, you know, dominant positions that had been popular for a very long time. So um, yeah, I think sitting on tokens, which, which by the way, I really love how since season three has started, sitting on objectives is far more important and yeah. Of, yeah i remember back in night vault when they were just like fainway crystal portals and they didn't <laughs> matter but uh um i think that's really cool that positioning part of the game i think is great so i uh, i enjoy that but i think that's something that if you're playing a deck in this meta you just have to be aware of for sure yeah sure. yeah i think a, a close cousin to that is uh restricted now but uh scant resources um i think you Yep. should have because some decks are going to continue to include that and so besides having a plan what do i do if i'm playing against one of these you know uh death's domain or you know one of these hold all but also all are held um got to think about it do i have a way to not mess myself up too bad but maybe flip one on my way in um to enemy territory and then step off it so scant doesn't score um, yep. yeah correct yeah so that is running us through a lot of the meta, what we sort of see as the meta anyway. Things to keep in mind, what some cards to keep in mind, um, just so you don't get caught out. Obviously, uh, for figuring out what best goes in your deck, as we mentioned, like you want ease of scoring, but um, some of that is also just like what what's adaptable? What can you do consistently regardless of your opponent? Um, 
And so, uh, you know, we can't necessarily always help with that stuff, but like it's worth getting to a point where you are super familiar with your deck and then practicing things like, okay, if I do this hand draw and I'm into, you know, a three fighter warband, how much of this is scorable? How, how do I want to mulligan? Like, I don't know yeah. if you guys do any of that practicing of like mulligans and board setups, but, well, um, if I can even back up, you mentioned familiarity. I can sure. back up even more. Cause like you said, we're six weeks out. And so if you're still kind of deciding on your warband, uh, we, you can talk about the meta all day long, but if you have to learn something new from scratch and maybe you're only playing a couple games a week or something like that. Yeah. And maybe you're better off going with the, the familiar. Here's a warband. I know what risks to take. Like you know, all yep. of us here, I don't think any of us here are going to take reavers unless we go down crazy, <laughs> um, crazy which down. never say never, but uh, but I think any one of us has played them enough where that would at least feel familiar. You'd be like, I, I know exactly how these guys inspire. I know, you know, uh, I have some ideas on, you know, like just all this stuff is coming naturally threat range and who to use first and who you are willing to risk and all that sort of thing. Um, so just, uh, if you're still deciding, I just want to put an argument out there for familiarity is, uh, sometimes better than finding the, the perfect meta or counter meta pick. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. And um, I think, you know, Phil, you're, um, you're touching on a lot of this, but um, yeah, once, once you can decide which, whatever warband you're going to play and start practicing, you know, I've always found it, what's really helpful is to prep as much as you can on game variables, which can be easily simulated. And by, by that, I mean, certain scenarios are pretty easy to simulate, right? So which board do you choose if you need to place a board down first, for example, right? right? Um, others are harder to simulate, right? So if it's really hard to simulate, uh, like who do you activate first in the second activation of the third phase of the second <laughs> game of a matchup versus like thorns? Like that's, you know, that, yeah. that type of stuff is hard to simulate. But yeah. there are a lot of things like board choices, uh, to Phil's point, which hands to mulligan, so in, in short, you know, which cards do you prefer to start with and which cards do you not want to start with? Um, model placement on the boards um, and how these choices are going to be impacted by what you feel are going to be maybe the top two or three meta or war bands you're going to see, right? Yeah. So I think if, if you can practice as much with that before an event and you don't have to think about that as much, I think two things happen. Um, first of all, it frees your mind for harder decisions, which will come later in the game. So you kind of just know, okay, I pretty much know how I'm going to do this for the first, you know, 10, 15 minutes of this game. And then you're again, more free to think about other things that can come up in a competitive game. And lastly, I think it, you know, it helps you play faster, which I think is all, always just a courteous thing to do. And I think, um, especially in a competitive event, I think it's important to remember there is a timer on rounds. So you got to make sure you want to finish all your games. Sure. Yeah. yeah to to that uh the idea of that uh board selection and mulligan or don't mulligan those are especially because they're the things that happen at setup you can actually get quite a few reps out of those so um i i thought about this actually after the fact uh phil you and i both had kind of finished a little bit early on the last uh in person and i was like you know what we actually could have done like we probably we're we're a little close on time but we could have done Let's just take 10 minutes, you know, it would say you one roll off, set your board, I'll set my board. You know, you, you mm -hmm. go through deployment in that first right. hand and then just lay them out and say, what do you think? You know, like I, I mulliganed into this, this is what I had. And then you can, you can, uh, you can kind of compare notes and say, yeah, I, you know, this, this card worries me from my, this perspective, if you've got a practice partner who's willing to do that, but you can do that several times, um, uh, even if you didn't have time for a full game. And I think that's pretty valuable. I think that's pretty good bang for your buck. I would, I should say. Yeah. Uh, too bad. We didn't think about that. <laughs> 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 Sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think last time, uh, at least I only brought, so I had sort of narrowed down my board choices and I only brought the boards that I knew I was going to want to use. Uh, I didn't mm. even bring all of my boards cause it was like, I pretty much know that my go-to choices are like three or four things. So I don't need to bring like however many boards it actually is. It's like eight or whatever. Uh, I, you know, I'm just going to take these two or three and be good to go with yeah. six total sides. Um, I guess the current rules even promote that a little bit because with the, with the uh, alternating. So if, if you win the roll off and then 
the other, you know, un- unless unless one of you makes an error on that first choice, um, you probably just need, you know, you probably only need a couple that are a couple of each that's I'm placing first or I'm placing second. Yeah, that's yeah. a great rule change, by the way. I really like that. Yeah. It certainly yeah. helps. Uh, it makes it feel a lot better when you have things go horribly wrong in the round first round. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, it's a great rule change, but it's also one I think a lot of people don't see a lot of because I don't, think don't a lot of play in-person plays is best yeah. of one. If you're showing up, you're saying, ah, I'll play best of one. Now let's change it up. Let's play against somebody yeah. else. So Yeah, um, no, good point. You know, one thing, and I know I'm not sure which, um, I guess, uh, which website listeners will use as far as how to how they you know align their decks and set all that stuff up. I think... It seems like the uh, Underworlds community is kind of like Red Sox, Yankees. You either are an Underworlds, <laughs> Underworlds DB fan or a Deckers yeah. fan. Yeah. Uh, I haven't used Deckers. I've just used Underworlds DB. It's my preference. But they, and I'm, so I don't know if Deckers has this uh, functionality. Um, I hope they, they would. But the card draw simulator on Underworlds DB is amazing. Yeah. And I actually, great. since I don't, I don't get to play a ton of games. I'll sit there and you know, understanding what you're going to mulligan and what you're not going to mulligan is really important. So I'll just like, if I, you know, I have like 20 minutes and I want to think about my deck, I'll just hit the card draw simulator over and over and over again. Like, Hey, would I keep this or would I ditch this? Right. Or yeah. if I'm going to match up versus this war band, would I keep this or would I ditch this just to get a kind of that muscle memory of, you know, what, what I would keep. And I think that hopefully will, you know, would help me make better decisions in the actual event. So I can already be, okay, yeah, I, I've seen this before. This probably won't work out, you know, and let me mulligan. And and speaking of rule changes, the new mulligan rule is also a great change, I think. And yeah. I'm, I'm really happy they implemented that. Yeah, it took me a little uh, thinking to, to wrap my head around to where I was like, oh, you know, like it, it means you can be riskier in your deck construction, but maybe not necessarily. What I just like that it's not like, well, I, you know, because for a while there was, it was a kiss of death. If you mulligan, if I got to throw away three objectives, like I, I, you know, almost, you haven't lost it, but you're, you're close, you know, like you, yeah, yeah. you lose theoretically, you know, 25% of the glory potential out of your, out of your deck. So, uh, just felt it, so it much just, worse. Yeah. No, correct. Like it, it kind of eliminated an unnecessary lose condition yeah. right at the outset of the game where if yeah. you just got really unlucky and had like three really big end phases in that hand yeah i, I to your point I, I see your point like maybe you should construct your deck differently then right but i think it's yeah. hard to not have some combination of cards which is just like just yeah. the worst one to get at the start of the game yeah, yeah. so yeah. um but well, to, yeah to have to ditch that completely and discard those i think was overly punitive for for something that's a random chance not a decision so sure. i think I think the new rules a lot better. Yeah, I've come I've come around to it big time. You know, I wasn't against it, but uh, I just took some getting used to it. And and it's on both sides. Like I, I like being able to do it for myself, and then I like you know playing. If you play against an opponent, and they're like, yeah, I had to throw nine glory out in my opening hand because uh, I had my worst possible draw. And you're like, yeah, I was you know we <laughs> spent half an hour playing where I had a, a big advantage, and that that's not as satisfying. So yeah, yeah, agreed I'm there. But yeah, so practicing those, you can do them in person or you can do them on the, on the deck builders. That's, uh, or at least the one yeah. that we know of. I think the only other thing that I would say is the, have a plan for getting hallway longboarded. Yeah. You're going to see it. doesn't happen all the time, but it's probably going to happen at least once. And, uh, make sure you've got a board specifically for that situation. Yeah. Uh, and maybe even specifically, you know, it depends on what warband you have, but um, if you are all aggro or all the other way, then um, then you kind of know. Like, if I if I am placing my board first, um, I know what they're likely to do. If they're but if you're flex, you probably want to have an idea of like, okay, what if I get what board do I want to put if I if I think they're gonna if I have to put a board down first and. Uh, I have to think about what board that would be if I expect to get long boarded or what board that would be if I expect to get wide boarded. So you, the, the more flexible that your deck, the more options you may need to have on tab, but, um, looking through them, uh, we were just talking about it with our local group. I was, I was, uh, shouting out, uh, was it the blood rack hive blood something Yeah, um, one of those. from a Rita mortis too is, is a, has got a great small fighter 
aggressive deployment. If you get long boarded, you're still going to have two way up front uh, sort of thing. So making sure people were aware that board was out there. Guys, when it comes to the day, make sure you have this if you think you need it. So, yeah. Yeah, good point. All right. Uh, any final thoughts for deck prep, warband prep, meta prep? Any any of the sort of in-play prep? I guess the last, last thing I would say is that um, when you're tweaking your deck and trying to figure out which cards are auto includes and which cards are fringe cards. I uh, just one rule of thumb I've always had is um in my mind the hallmark of a good card in underworlds is that it's useful in many scenarios when you draw it, as many as possible. Mm. Uh, mm. I typically prefer overall utility versus like situational awesomeness, right? <laughs> just, sure. um, there are a lot of variables every time you play. And the more variables you limit, I think it's just, um, I, I think it's just more reliable. So uh, yeah. other people can have different preferences. Other people can kind of like cards that are more swings for the fences, right? Like yeah. I think of like, like drawing power is a, is a great example. Because yeah. if you have like drawing power in the first phase and like Molog or like Hroth or something crazy like that, then that's, that's great. That's really, really, really good. Um, but if you draw it, later um you're typically kind of playing that card at the end of the phase so if you draw it in the second phase then you're really just using it in the third phase and mm -hmm. if you draw it in the third phase you're really just not using it so yeah um you know they're uh, again but other people may have different preferences minds just to be to have cards that are more useful in, in as many scenarios as possible yeah i mean when in doubt go with the the sidestep or the distraction clone right like because those you're going to be hard pressed to find a situation where I have sidestep in hand and there's nothing I can do with it. That yeah, is correct. useful, you know? Correct. Yeah, um, correct. I mean, those are so that that's the opposite of corner case. It's, it's incredibly broad. Like all my fighters are dead. Okay. Yes. You can't use sidestep. You're in trouble <laughs> anyway, you know, you got some bigger problems here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, you know, and it's, it's easy to get lured in by, by something that has like an incredibly powerful flashy, uh, you know, Thing that it can do but if it's if it relies on a certain combination of fighters still being alive well it's just not going to happen sometimes yeah, yeah I agree. absolutely well i think with that we we have a few questions from the listeners that are sort of uh things to do outside of just the game itself so um i guess just to give people a quick shout outs um so for questions so I assume this one is from Requisin. I it's I think yeah. I think that's okay. So so it's just asking like what warbands do we accept, expect to see f featured at Adepticon heavily? Uh, I think we pretty well hit this. Um, I think Dread Pageant is probably still going to be featured pretty heavily, although I don't think we mentioned it very much. Um, but yeah, so definitely covered that. Um, just talked about, and we're going to talk some more about like what what all goes into prep besides. Just games. We had this question from Joe Cody SZ. Um, one thing that I was thinking about and like to sort of get prepared for is sort of getting your mind prepared for the Grand Clash. I think in the last one, I wasn't necessarily like in the mind state of like how long and how <laughs> mentally taxing this was going to be. Um, I think I think it's slated to run eight hours. <laughs> I think is the t is the actual like event time. I think it's like eleven thirty to nine or something like that is what they have listed for the event. It probably won't go that long, but like still, you know that's that's a long time to be doing this, um, even mm. with a break in the middle. And I think like, and I think I think you'd mentioned this, Jimmy, of just trying to like limit the number of things you need to think about like consciously because you really are gonna have, you know, you get to round three or four, and it's like okay, I'm playing my ninth game today. Let's, <laughs> what, do, what do I need to be focused on? And it's probably not what boards to pick. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Yet, um, so speaking of this, um, everyone will have, I think, their own way to to get ready. I think, I think to your point, Phil, and, and I know Davey, you think about this a lot too, like 
um, it, it is draining. It is draining to be playing, you know, a, a mentally intensive game for that long. So just, yeah, just um, whatever works best for you, be it get a, you know, long night sleep the night before, whether it's, I don't know, go drinking a lot the night before, whatever works <laughs> best for you, <laughs> whatever works best for you to be best prepared for that. Like, yeah, just think about that. Um, but um, you guys have a really good point here in the notes i think the biggest thing just to always constantly remind yourself of is just do your best not to get tilted yeah yep Yep. things are going to happen that are not going to be convenient that's just playing this many games in one day uh it's just it's really uncommon if everything just goes right there are going to be things that go wrong and that's actually one of the features of underworlds that i enjoy the most is that since it's a best of three format if one game goes terribly wrong you have potentially two other games to play to kind of reverse that. So I think it's really important just to stay within your head, not get tilted. Um, I've seen it happen to so many people in competitive scenarios where, you know, I may have been totally on the ropes, but um, I think they made some suboptimal decisions because of some rolls or card draws that happened earlier in that game that they they were still thinking about. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, I think that's a really, really important thing. Just do your best not to get tilted and something that, that I do mentally in my head. And this is maybe just like my inner cynic, but when rolls are about to happen, I almost like think in my head, like, okay, that's not going to hit. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I kind of, I kind of mentally prepare myself for the, the outcome being something I don't want and then, and try to start thinking of, you know, contingencies if it doesn't. Sure. And, uh, and then either I'm happily surprised or I've already kind of mentally prepared myself as not going to, you know, the outcome's not going to be what I want. So, um, maybe that's a little too cynical for some people, but again, most importantly, however you want to do it, just try your best not to get tilted, understand randomness is part of all these games. And then, at any point, the luck could totally tilt back in, no pun intended, back in your favor. Yeah. Um, one thing that we haven't touched on is uh, the idea of uh, playing faster games. So this isn't this isn't totally outside. You know, Joe Cody was asking what what goes into your prep besides just playing games, but playing your games quickly, like making get used to making your decisions quickly. Because if you have to go to three games, it's really tight. You know, play a yep. full game in 30 minutes, and especially since, you know, we're used to playing with a lot of folks we like hanging out with. And so there's a lot of chat and banter. And I, I'm inclined to do that in a in a tournament as well. I, I just kind of like getting to know the person across from me. Uh, but that can leave you vulnerable to like, whoops, we we kind of burned through a lot of our time making jokes about, you know, <laughs> how Spite Room is totally going to, you know, kill Targor or something. You yeah. Know? So, <laughs> uh so, uh, getting used to, I mean, no joke, like time your games. Cause they're probably taking longer than you realize they're taking. Yeah. I mean, if you really want to go to the extreme, you can even just get like a chess clock or, uh, they have apps for chess clocks that are easy to download. Um, and that way you can like keep track of your time versus the total game time. Mm-hmm. Um, cause sometimes like if you're playing somebody who's not necessarily prepping at the same level you are, or maybe isn't even prepping oh, sure, for a tournament yeah. at all. That's a good point. You don't necessarily want to hold them to the same standard, but you still want to keep track of how long your turns are taking. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, and I think this pairs pretty well into another question that Joe Cody SZ had, which is just etiquette rec- uh, recommendations. Um, yeah. Think- what do you, can we go around the uh, around the horn here? Everybody give a, a solid etiquette recommendation for tournament play. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. so along with don't get tilted, like try to be genial like to and like pleasant to your opponent whether you're winning or losing um and if they're very obviously upset like just kind of give them that space to cool down because you don't you know it doesn't help anybody to continue to let people get upset um and like if someone is taking a really long time and you feel like you are going to run out of time i think there's ways to approach that of just being like um like you can kind of remind people of like, Hey, you know, we're at such and such minutes on the clock or like, you don't necessarily be like, Hey, can you hurry up your turn? Like that's kind of rude, but at the same time you can get punished for that. So, um, I think there's, there's good ways of doing it. Um, I think even just like having a call out for like, 
we're at this time in the match or something. Like, that's, yeah, that's... I mean, I think it, oh, when you say good ways of doing it, I think one of them is is uh, maybe taking note early. You know, pay attention. Yep. Like, hey, first game's done. We're at forty minutes or something. You know, yeah, just yeah, yeah. like um, it, it it won't help anyone if you're like, oh man, we only have seven minutes left. Uh, hope we can get game three in. You know, so yeah, yeah. That's that's too late to be raising that, and that's yep. that's not gonna help. Yeah, no, it's a, all, all good points. I think, uh, yeah, uh, timing and, and uh, yeah, the two things I think about in terms of etiquette, and there are other things, right? But yeah, timings and making sure you're not taking too long. And then, as we mentioned before, just avoiding getting tilted. Uh, I think those are just two really important things in a competitive event. Uh, and, you know, again, what things that I just think about that, and for any players out there that are, needing some type of internal monologue to remind themselves of like how to put all this perspective is just like to continue to think, Hey, we are playing a game of, with plastic toy soldiers, right? So it's like, <laughs> let's not take this too seriously here. <laughs> let's not, let's not take this too seriously. Um, things happen. And I think uh, if you think about it that way, I think hopefully you won't get as tilted. Yeah. And secondarily also just yeah, be mindful of your opponent, play fast. You don't need, to take you know two minutes for every single decision and min max all of that just because look we're in the end it's a game and, yep. the, and we're having a lot of fun doing it hopefully yeah uh my one you guys kind of hit the big things my my one to add on is uh make sure you got uh legible dice there's there's some weird underworlds dice out there that oh, yeah. you know some of the packs are awful hard to read um, if you really attach those and bring them up, maybe, maybe bring like the core core dice. Uh, those are, those are pretty universally readable. Cause you, you could even be playing somebody who's, you know, got vision issues or something like that. Yeah, great, great point. Yeah. Um, great point. and there's, there's a few things more frustrating being like, well, I see you rolled a defense roll. I, you're going to have to tell me like, well, <laughs> I don't know what you roll. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Please um, <laughs> enlighten and, me. And, <laughs> sometimes it's a it's a lighting issue like sometimes the, the light that you're used to playing in is these dice show up great and uh you get into that weird tournament hall and all of a sudden you can't see them so maybe just bring some back up with the core yeah. ones and also i have a dice tray that i use that i think mm. i've seen other folks do the same thing and it's mm -hmm. like it's foldable and something that you know i can just clip together and it's easy to put in my box and uh yeah i think having dice trays are really helpful because then you avoid like, you know, dice flying off the table, flying onto another board, you know, and, um, uh, flying and hitting models. So yeah, yeah I think having a dice tray is nice for something like this too. Yeah, definitely. Oh yeah. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat. I got one more, I think. Uh, and that, <laughs> well, that's, I, uh, I I this too. is a, this, <laughs> this is a bigger topic, but, uh, I think in general, like maybe try not to ask for any take backs. Like you, you oh, made an yeah. error, you know, it's, it's one thing in, uh, in casual play, um, and your, your opponent may say, no, no, you know, like if you notice like, whoops, I forgot to do this, your opponent may volunteer that, but to, to ask for it kind of puts your opponent in a, in a tough spot where they got a great point. You know, great point. Um, yep. and, and it's on you, you know, and, and, uh, and it should be part of your practice is, is, uh, timing windows. And I heard you yep. even saying that in your game, Phil, and I was actually guilty of it, um, where I was, you know, forgetting some, some of the things. So, uh, and, and uh, the wonderful point, And I think the biggest issue here is with reaction windows, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you've missed your reaction window for something and it's like literally the next activation or you've gone into the power step, like it's, it, it's over, right? Yeah, and yeah. To your, to your point, Davey, it's a little, it puts your opponent in an uncomfortable situation if you ask for a take back on that. And so just, Another reason why practice is so helpful, right? Another reason why is, you know, you mentioned earlier, play a war man, you know, um, it'll help avoid a lot of this stuff. And there are a lot of important reactions in the game, right? So uh, um, just be mindful of that. That's a, a great point. Yeah. My sort of rule of thumb there is like, if the game state has moved forward, I should probably not ask to go back. Um, mm. if, if nothing has changed yet, like if I technically said pass and then immediately was like, wait a minute, I have a reaction. I don't feel too badly about being like, oh, you know, let's back up just a half second. I, I missed this card. But if they've already played another card and I'm like, oh, man, I didn't react. It's like, yep, that's too light. You can't go back that far because yeah. um, it's too many decision points to try and back up. Rewinding that is very difficult. Um, only other etiquette thing, and I just was thinking about it because we, we sort of talked about not wanting to burn up too much of the clock is like you will probably have time after your round um 
So like do your introductions to say like, hey, this is my name, who I am. We know each other. We know each other's names for the game. And then that's about it at the start, because you're usually on the clock by the time rounds are announced. But afterwards, you can, you know, talk through the game. You can if they're, you know, if they have questions or if you have questions and they're seeming amenable to it. Some people are like, oh, I don't want to talk about it, the deck at all, because, you know, it's a tournament. But um, I think the post game can be a, a place to sort of have some more of those conversations without it impacting games. And that pretty much does it for all the questions that were specific to tournament prep Adepticon. Uh, we do have sort of this one outstanding one. This is more yeah. of just a question of uh, who do we think takes it all? Who do we think yeah. is going to win? So uh, you know, we got a couple others that we're going to we're going to return to at a later episode because they're a little off topic here. But uh, yeah, here I'm going to throw this at you guys. So uh, we already kind of talked a little dark dark horse, but so if you if you have some repeat, but but I want you to uh, and this is also from Joe Cody. But uh, what warband? If you had to pick one warband that you think is going to take it all at this Grand Clash, what would you pick? Like, what what do you think it, it's, it's going to be? What do you hope it's going to be? And is, and you can throw out a dark horse if you want as well. Um, Phil, are you ready for that? Yeah. Um, all right, go for it. I, f- I don't know how comfortable I feel with the pick, but I feel like Hrothgorn has a really good shot here. Like, he's got, mm. he's got all the tools that he needs. The only thing that sort of concerns me is that he does have all those Noblars to just sort of bleed glory, but, like, you got to run past Hrothgorn. That's not fun. (laughs) Right Um, into the trap, which I always do. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I think he's got a good shot. I, I would definitely expect to see him at least in the top cut, if not winning at all. Okay. Um, I, I would like to be able to see Seraphon do really well just because they're, they're my favorite war band. I might end up playing them still for the familiarity, but I don't know if they play into this meta. Right. And then, dark horse i mean like it would be crazy but we just saw some i think it was just the the thursday community uh game for vassal where eyes of the nine won and i know that's a small (laughs) tournament like it's it's more casual it's smaller but control eyes of the nine won and it's sort of like hmm nobody's probably gonna be preparing for that (laughs) <laughs> that's not that's not just a dark horse that's like a dark matter horse yeah <laughs> like, it's, it's <laughs> from a completely different dimension uh but it would be awesome um it's like, it's like, it's like a dark pony it's much smaller <laughs> than a dark horse yeah. you know and and i lost to them in my last round last adepticon so oh that's it, right uh, turret vortimus turret vortimus and, down. <laughs> yeah got, got my mcgore's good uh but yeah uh davy what a, what about you yeah. Um, well, uh, what I think is going to win, I uh, I actually think Cunning Crew might have. They've got a lot of tools. Yeah. Um, I think they've got uh, a lot of the flexibility, and and uh, they're not dealing with some of the restrictions that other folks are. And I think uh, there's people who've uh, gotten in and maybe gotten the reps with it because they're part of the new season. So hmm. that that might be the one I throw out there. My hope. Uh, I would almost cast it as wide as a Dire Chasm Warband because I like them all so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I know some of our guys are bringing Dire Chasm Warbands, and so I'd mean it'd be one of them. Um, but, uh, man, that's tough. Uh, I I think it would be pretty amazing to see Soul Raid up there. And I uh, so that would be that'd be a hope because that, that's such like a technical toolbox warband yeah. um, that uh, that'd be cool to see someone bring it home with that. And my dark horse, I'm gonna stick with the uh, deep cut of uh, sepulchral guard. I think somebody might surprise the yeah. the field with that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, nobody's mentioned a death war band yet. <laughs> what? <laughs> what uh, <laughs> well, I guess sepulchral. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Jimmy? Yeah, I mean, you guys have uh, mentioned some really, really good options. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know, if I were to add an additional war band to get some to uh, to the warband list that could win, or I think is going to win. Um, you know, again, yeah, Peralta is really good. There are a lot of good options. I think, I think Dreppers are still really yeah. good, just really good cards. Again, the range two is wonderful, especially if you want to sit on tokens and be aggressive at the same time. So I think, uh, I think Dreppers are really good and they have a lot of different play styles. And then um, as far as a dark horse, um, you know, it's not, um, I don't know how much of a 
dark horse they are, but uh, I know Compact's been doing a great job with them, but Mad Mob, mm, he's been killing yeah. it with Mad Mob, and he's an excellent player. Uh, so he's been, and he's doing this in the online games, and I think maybe some live games in the UK, but um, uh, I played against him in one of the Vassa League games in, I think, um, I think in the quarterfinals, and it, it he's, you know, he's got some some nasty tricks with the Mad Mob stuff. And to Davey's point earlier, there are a lot of primacy cards, right? And certain warbands just don't play primacy very well, and all those cards are excluded. But Mad Mob probably plays primacy the best, right? Yeah. So they have access to all those cards and do very well with them, like Surge, Surge of Aggression, Everything to Prove, all those things. So, um, yeah, I think Mad Mob is be a very interesting one. Um, be a lot of fun to see them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There you go, Skylar. <laughs> He's one of our locals. He's he's been practicing Mad Mob <laughs> quite a bit. Um, oh. Hopefully, yeah. he can do well with them. Yeah, uh, I guess yeah. So we got one from a couple from Ruckus, and that we're gonna save for another time. Uh, we should mention Durai asked uh, if Underworlds was an Olympic sport, which would it be? Uh, I can't think of a better answer than what uh, Josh already uh, threw up when it was uh, decathlon. So, yeah, but deck. <laughs> real <laughs> real dad joke. Little dad <laughs> joke in there. Yeah. Real groaner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty great. All right. Any final thoughts, guys? Uh, only that uh, playing in person and prepping for something like I've been. It kind of reignited. Uh, anyway, you know, I, I have consistently enjoyed the game, but getting to like. I've built so many decks in the past, like a oh, couple weeks. I uh, know, I, like I build think... and rebuild, and then go find something that somebody else built, and then um, and get halfway through one and say, "Oh, actually, this gives me an idea for this other one." And so, uh, my my saved deck list is really out of hand. I had to go through and like <laughs> delete a bunch because I'm like, I can't even find the ones that I I want. Yeah, I got so yep. much, and I always come up with dumb names for them and that don't actually mean anything. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> like, oh, what even is this? Like, oh, something that has 12 restricted gone you go yeah so um, delete yeah um so yeah that's uh this this prep thing i like playing all kinds of different ways but i'm I'm invigorated by the idea of prepping for it it's part of why we're doing this app absolutely yeah no i i um sadly uh i just by nature of my recent work schedule and everything else i have actually not played a live underworlds game since the start of the pandemic so oh i uh, <laughs> i i um i hope to do so certainly before adepticon yeah. uh but um but yeah i i agree it's playing in person is so much fun i miss it and the fact that we have live events now is has like reinvigorated um my joy in the game because even looking forward to it little and even playing in it so sure. uh, I'm, i think it's a really it's, it's a good thing so appreciative of everyone who's putting this one together yeah i mean to that point like before anybody you know thinks hey my chances aren't that great there's a lot of people coming at it from the same thing where have not had the kind of reps that they've had in the past like there's going to be like just because you you know i was like well I, I was getting ready to say like i'm i'm real rusty you know uh and that's true you know I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not I haven't played the volume of games that I I did in the run up for like 2019 and stuff like that, but uh, but so are a lot of people. So like, just get out there and play those games and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, great point. Yeah, and if nothing else, have some fun. At least do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we we sometimes forget that like there's all this prep and this pressure and like it's a tournament. We got to do great, but it's also just a good opportunity to play a whole bunch of games. Like yeah. how, how many times are you going to play like nine to 12 games in a day or whatever? <laughs> so it's definitely good. Um, if you're listening to this and you're on the fence about going to Adepticon and you're, you know, cleared for all the, you know, pandemic related reasons, because like, I'm not going to say absolutely you should be there. There's no excuse because obviously you have a very good excuse right now. But if you're comfortable with it, you've got, you know, all the precautions taken, um, I think it'd be great to have more folks show up. So if you're on the fence, uh, here's a little push. Yeah, we'd love to see you. That'd be great. (laughs) Totally. All right. I think that'll do it for today. Um, If you have any uh, comments, feedback, questions that you'd like to get in touch with us, um, you can do so at WTHCast on Twitter or whatthehexcast at gmail.com. Uh, if you'd like to check out any of our older episodes, other shows in the Mortal Realms network that we're a part of, you can go to themortalrealms.com, check out all our stuff, a uh, whole bunch of stuff there. 
Um, as always, thanks for listening. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, any feedback is also really great. Um, obviously, uh, you know, if, if you, if you have uh, episode ideas for us, or if you've got, uh, you know, thoughts on other things for prepping that we can, you know, get out there to the rest of the community, let us know. Uh, coming up next, I have no idea. We'll, <laughs> we'll definitely yeah. think of something. We, we've got a couple questions uh, from Marcos and that may develop into a full episode. Yeah, yeah. It depends. Uh, we, we need some help from some of our uh, network uh, co-conspirators. Uh, yep. Yep. What's, yep. What's the word? Yeah, what, whatever you want uh, to call them. Yeah. And that, so, but uh, we'll keep it, keep it spicy. Uh, yeah. And this will be the first episode coming out on a Saturday. It'll be on Saturdays from here on out. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exciting. Exciting new world. <laughs> so different <laughs> <laughs> two two whole days different um cool and uh david do you have any recommended listening for folks today yeah um this uh we hopefully this is not the case but we we went for uh train in vain by the clash <laughs> uh, or or i guess anything by akon so it seems appropriate yeah all right for what the hex i've been phil i've been davy i've been jimmy thoughtful but as brief as i can with my comments just <laughs> so sure. you know it's it's always kind of a pain if someone just goes on and on so i'll try to be as um you know never never stops us that. so no yeah. <laughs> people seem to keep listening to what we have to say so. <laughs>